It's been over five years since my ex-wife, Adelia Lynn Masters, a former branch manager at Bank of America, asked for a divorce. Her explanation was straightforward, she no longer loved me. She insisted there was no external influence, claiming we had simply grown apart. Though I had my suspicions, I never found proof to confirm them. We settled on joint custody of our daughters, who were 14 and 12 at the time. After consulting with professionals, both girls chose to live with her. I was reminded of all this when I read an article in USA Today on Thursday morning, a paper I subscribed to. The article featured Adelia Lynn Peterson, now a junior vice president at a regional office, and her husband, senior vice president Ronald Peterson, attending a charity event in New York. Another photo showed Adelia's daughters, Amanda and Miranda Peterson, now 19 and 17, beautifully dressed and described as promising young women. It seemed that Adelia had achieved the success and social standing she had always wanted. Her current husband, once a mere acquaintance, was mentioned as well. They had met when Adelia began working at the local Bank of America branch. At one time, those girls were my daughters, but now we live separate lives, even carrying different last names. I immediately called my trusted assistant, Helen Beard, to verify what I was seeing. If my hunch was right, it would explain why all our efforts to find them had failed. However, Helen, who I later found out was distantly related to my wife, wasn't available the day due to personal reasons. I recalled the day of our divorce. Adelia never showed up in court, leaving me to question the future of our family. I consulted with my lawyer to understand what was happening. Without her presence, the judge demanded we both be there to confirm the information presented by our attorneys. Adelia's lawyer claimed she had been transferred out of state. When asked if I had consented to our children's relocation, I replied no. That's when the nightmare began. Judge Donald McDonald's demeanor shifted immediately. He asked me to try contacting her via her cell phone. After leaving the courtroom, I dialed her numbers, but they were no longer in service. I turned to social media, only to discover I had been unfriended and blocked by both her and the girls. Back in court, I informed my lawyer, who relayed this to the judge. Without hesitation, the judge issued a warrant for Adelia's arrest on charges of child abduction. He also suspended the divorce proceedings until she appeared in court. Adelia's lawyer was livid, pleading with the judge to reconsider. He argued that this was a minor issue since I could confirm our previous agreement. While the judge acknowledged my testimony, I reiterated that I had never given permission for the children to leave the state. The lawyer even implied I could be lying. That's why she needs to be here, the judge firmly stated, adding that both daughters should also be present for a police investigation. I later learned that Adelia had requested a job transfer, citing abuse of our daughters by local Bank of America employees, a claim that was accepted without question. When the police requested evidence to back up her claims, no one could provide any. Everything was based solely on Adelia's allegations, which everyone seemed to take at face value. The women in our extended family were well acquainted with Adelia. When privately questioned about her accusations, they all responded similarly, what does it matter? I'm just a man. Even social services, who had interviewed the girls, were unaware of these allegations, as neither daughter had mentioned me during their thorough questioning. There was no hint of truth in these claims. Still, rumors persisted in our town, fueled by members of Adelia's extended family. Over the past five years, the judge and I had maintained contact, forming a friendship over our mutual passion for fly fishing. So, it wasn't surprising when, one evening after dinner, I found myself at his home, newspaper in hand. You need to see this, I said, my voice grave as I showed him the article. Damn it, the judge muttered, quickly pulling out his phone. John, give me a moment. The photo displayed my two daughters, and as the judge took it in, his face turned pale. My God, they'd been right under our noses this entire time. I stepped outside and sat in their courtyard. Ruth, the judge's wife, came out with a beer for each of us. He's furious. I'd never seen him this mad, Ruth commented. He's on the phone with the FBI, I replied. What did you show him? Ruth asked. A photo from today's newspaper, showing my missing wife with her new husband. For five years, we've had no sign of her, and suddenly she's alive and well. 
As I continued to examine the second photo on the page, I noticed my daughters had taken a new last name. The situation had become far more complicated than I'd realized. With interstate abduction involved, it was now a federal case, and the FBI had to intervene. Ruth asked why Bank of America hadn't assisted in locating her. I explained that they had been granted a federal appeals court order, which allowed them to challenge the court order I'd been given. They had argued that it was a family matter and thus beyond their jurisdiction. Tell the judge I left because I needed some time to process everything. Let him know he can reach me at my office tomorrow morning, I instructed Ruth. The previous night had been particularly hard on me. I began to wonder if there was more to Adelia's relationship with her new husband than mere friendship. After our wedding, she had been hired as a financial loan specialist in his department, just as I was starting my own consulting firm. The question of my daughter's paternity began to nod me, was Amanda truly my child, or his? Did anyone know the real answer? Then I reminded myself that Amanda had been born before Adelia ever joined the bank. The next morning, my mind drifted to Helen. How could she possibly help resolve this mess? Over the past five years, her resentment towards her cousin had only grown. I trusted Helen, and her actions had consistently proved she was loyal to me. There were times when I wanted to express my feelings for her, but I always held back. She deserved the best, and I couldn't bring her into the chaos of my life. Still, I couldn't help but admire her. Her light brown hair, soft smile, and warm heart were qualities any man would cherish. I dreamed about her, but I knew now was not the time. I couldn't ask her to share the nightmare I was living. The following day was hectic at work, and I welcomed the busyness as a much-needed distraction. Yet, as the hours passed, I couldn't shake the feeling that my life had taken an incomprehensible turn. Near the end of the day, a knock at the door interrupted my thoughts, and Helen, my assistant, walked in, pulling me back to reality. John, there are two FBI agents here to see you. Shall I let them in? Helen asked. Yes, I've been expecting them, I replied, standing up from my desk. As the agents entered, I greeted them, how can I assist you? First, I'm Mac Holmes, and this is Douglas Dale, Mac introduced them both. We're here to gather some background information regarding your situation. I explained to them how I had known Adelia's current husband years ago and emphasized that, to the best of my knowledge, there had been no affair back then. However, the change in my daughter's last name and the circumstances of Adelia's remarriage left many questions unanswered. At this point, I think the only way to clear up the uncertainty is to conduct DNA tests, I said, feeling the weight of my suspicions. I always believed Amanda, my eldest daughter, was born before Adelia started working at Bank of America. But now I can't help but wonder if she had met him earlier than I thought. I recounted how Judge Donald McDonald had halted the divorce proceedings, accusing Adelia of abducting her children. Her decision to disregard the court's order and not appear at the hearing raised doubts about whether she had also filed for divorce in New York and if her marriage to her new husband was even legal. Douglas looked surprised when I revealed that the divorce had never been finalized. According to court records, the divorce was suspended because Adelia had failed to comply with the judge's directive to attend court and ensure all agreed-upon terms were accurately documented. Judge Donald is a steadfast man, I continued, someone who's learned not to be swayed by others' disregard for the law, something he developed after a past experience with a crooked lawyer. Mac then asked, Did you ever give your wife permission to leave the state with the children? No, I responded firmly. I explained that it was only on the day in court that her lawyer had informed me of their move out of state. The judge had instructed me to try contacting them by phone, but when I did, I discovered their numbers were no longer active. I'd also been unfriended and blocked from their social media accounts. They left the state before the divorce was finalized, and Adelia remarried less than a week later, Doug noted, indicating that her actions had been deliberate, not accidental. That doesn't align with what she said in her interview earlier today in New York, Mac pointed out. When was the last time you spoke to your wife? Two days before our final court hearing, I replied. Adelia and our daughters came by the house to collect their last belongings. The children's services team spoke with them, and at that time, the girls chose to live with their mother. I informed Mac that I had never received any official legal notice of the divorce, which raised suspicions that the signatures on the adoption documents might have been forged. This gave us solid grounds to pursue charges against both individuals for covering up a federal crime. 
Mac Holmes persisted, I still haven't received an answer about the authenticity of those adoption documents. Turning to Helen, he added, Mr. Masters, could you sign your name here, Helen? Please draft a letter on our company letterhead confirming that I've complied with the FBI's request made by Mr. Holmes and Douglas Dale. The letter should also include a copy of my signature as per their request. Certify it, make a copy for our records, and hand them the original. I turned to Helen and asked, fully aware of her attention to detail, are you still living at the same address? Mac, from across the room, posed another question, prompting me to sigh before replying, I had to get a court order to sell the house. The local police were growing impatient with the gossip circulating about a supposed predator in the area. After my second heart attack, Judge McDonald froze our assets, and only when Adelia failed to appear in court was I granted permission to sell the property. Now I live in a house I built near Ryder Lake, outside the city. It's tucked away on five acres of land, giving me some much-needed privacy. To safeguard my peace, I made sure the house was connected to a reliable power source, as there are still people clinging to those harmful rumors. Once the agents left, I explained everything to Helen. The news that her estranged cousin Adelia had finally been located took her by surprise. Hope and curiosity flickered in her eyes, but there were still countless unanswered questions. Despite the new information, many puzzles remained unsolved, and I didn't have a single definitive answer to offer. Before I head home tonight, I'll switch off my mobile phone, I told Helen. If something urgent comes up, reach me on my home line. If my absence causes any issues, just make the best decision you see fit. Helen held deep contempt for her cousin Adelia, who had tarnished the reputation and relationships of good people, including mine. Because of the vicious rumors Adelia spread, I had lost close friends and family members. Helen had never believed someone could inflict such harm until she witnessed it firsthand. She often thought about the pain I had endured before the truth began to surface. For her, waiting for the situation to resolve itself had been a trial of patience. She reflected on human nature, believing that many are inclined to lie. People around town thought that without my business, I would have given up long ago. But instead, I threw myself into work, which paid off, as my client base expanded threefold. Two years ago, I began emerging from the shell I'd built around myself, though it coincided with the trout I used to fish for becoming scarce. What shocked Helen the most was that in all the years since Adelia and the children left, I never once mentioned their names. Watching me suffer in silence was unbearable for her. I was just a shadow of the person I had once been. Helen first met me when she was 14 and I was a 19-year-old financial planner at a pre-Christmas gathering hosted by our family. Adelia had just announced our engagement, which sparked excitement and attention. But even back then, Helen had a gut feeling that the relationship was doomed from the start. I always put the family's well-being first, while Adelia seemed more focused on climbing the social ladder and gaining recognition. It was obvious that our differing priorities would inevitably lead to a separation. Helen, despite believing that my marriage was solid and would endure, never shared her deeper feelings on the matter. Years earlier, Helen confided in Adelia's mother, predicting that if we had children, we would likely divorce once they reached their teenage years. She turned out to be right. Helen's own marriage ended abruptly when her husband died in the army, before they even had the chance to start a family. During that painful time, Helen leaned on me for support and guidance. I was there for her as she mourned, standing by her side as she bid farewell to her late husband. Our professional relationship deepened into a close friendship. Over the last five years, she witnessed my struggles and realized that she wanted me by her side when we both grew old. I was constantly battling memories of the past, which held me captive in a life shaped by the choices of others. Adelia's sudden disappearance, along with our children, sparked rumors that spread like wildfire. Some began to believe that I was involved in something nefarious, covering up some dark secret to protect my reputation. Others speculated that the security measures around my property were to hide bodies. One evening, after a long day, I decided to grab dinner at Ruby Tuesday. I opted for the unlimited salad bar and a side of catfish. As I made my way back to my table, Adelia's father, Roger, appeared out of nowhere. Without asking, he pulled out a chair and sat down with his large frame. I stayed silent, eating my meal, not engaging with the man who had once threatened me. Our public encounter only fueled the rumors that had already painted me as cruel toward my daughters. 
Despite the tension, Roger Carmichael mentioned that Adelia was determined to resolve the issues regarding Amanda and Miranda. Adelia eventually admitted that the accusations she had made against me about our daughters were fabricated. She had used that lie as an excuse for her sudden departure. I owe you an apology for believing her lies, Roger said. It seems she spread these false claims to other family members as well. I'll consider their apologies sincere only after they provide notarized statements detailing exactly what she said and her motivations, I replied, still focused on my plate. Roger agreed, saying that until someone came to his office with concrete information, he wouldn't trust their words. He went on to say that until the matter was addressed, he considered everyone involved dead to him. I understood his sentiment and acknowledged it. Roger expressed that he grasped the pain I had endured over the last five years. I asked him to let me finish my meal in peace. In a firm tone, I reminded him that too many people in this town, swayed by rumors from distant relatives, had wrongfully condemned me for something I never did. As I watched Roger leave, I couldn't help but question whether he really believed that a brief conversation could fix the deep wounds caused by his daughter. Did he think that a few minutes of dialogue could erase years of bitterness, grief, and anger that had been stirred by those around us? Did they truly believe that reconciliation was that simple? And did they assume I was so naive that I could just pretend like none of it had ever happened? A few minutes later, the waitress who had been serving me came over and sat down at my table. Mr. Masters, I went to school with your daughters, she began. From what I overheard, I can tell you that none of them had any clue about what was happening. In fact, that Friday before they disappeared, we were all excited to see each other again at school on Monday, she continued. I saw the man who just left working with other members of your wife's family as they packed up after she disappeared. After learning that, I felt I had to tell you, she added. Thank you for your honesty. It feels like a weight's been lifted off my shoulders, I replied, unsurprised at how long I had been kept in the dark. I try to stay low-key because I'm fed up with the rumors and lies, I said, with a hint of bitterness. After giving me a sympathetic look, she returned to her duties. I paid my bill with my card and left her one of the largest tips I could, feeling she deserved it. Over the weekend, I had spent some time canoeing on the lake, catching my daily limit of fish. I always let the extra ones go. Lately, fresh rainbow trout, cooked simply with flour and butter, had become one of my favorite meals. Every night, I enjoy two steamed trout with eggs and toast. When Monday came, I returned to work, brewed my first cup of coffee, and started reading USA Today. Finding nothing of interest in the headlines, I felt a bit disappointed, realizing that I had expected too much too soon. Helen arrived half an hour early that morning, something that only happened when things were unusually aligned. She poured herself a cup of coffee and joined me, seeming more energetic and excited than usual. We began reminiscing about the past, how Adelia and I had married right after high school. Amanda was born a little over a year later. In those early days, I was flipping houses, buying them at low prices, fixing them up, and selling them for a profit. Meanwhile, Adelia started her career at the bank, and I dove into learning the financial industry from scratch. I discovered I had a natural aptitude for it, and one of the previous business owners became my mentor. When my mentors decided to retire, I founded Masters Consulting. They continued working with me part-time, and the company's growth took off. By the time Miranda was born, I thought my future was fully set. Helen mentioned that everyone had heard about my encounter with Roger on Friday. Her phone had been ringing non-stop all weekend. I can't blame them, given everything your family's been through. You've become an outsider to them and in the community, she remarked. I know, I replied. I'm aware of that. I have a question, boss. Why do you need those notarized statements? Helen asked, her curiosity piqued. I smiled and said, for slander. Her eyes widened. Oh my god, you're going after everything they have, she exclaimed, then added with a laugh, well, isn't that what they deserve? Exactly, I replied. It's the only way to clear my name and rebuild my reputation. Plus, if I get a court order to freeze their assets while my defamation lawsuit is pending, it'll limit their ability to make any further moves. Helen nodded thoughtfully. Makes sense. They'll end up with a public defender. Do you really want them walking into federal court with a court-appointed lawyer? I asked. 
Looks like it's going to be a hectic week, boss. If everyone who reached out actually shows up, we're looking at around 20 cases, Helen commented, adding, most of these family members are generally honest and respectable. The issue is that they were deceived and mistook fiction for truth. I suggested they take some time during their Sunday church service to reflect on that. The real question is, what will they do now? Will their guilt lead them to make the right choice? As she passed by my desk with a warm smile, Helen casually mentioned that some single women enjoy fishing at dawn. For the first time in years, I found myself laughing on my way out to work. I made sure to thank her for lifting my spirits. Helen had always been my anchor. I truly believe that without her, I wouldn't have made it through the chaos of the last five years. By Thursday afternoon, we had gathered 24 notarized affidavits, each echoing the same story. My wife, with whom I shared only a nominal marriage, told them all she needed to flee the city because I had allegedly mistreated our daughters for years. She claimed she had found the courage to leave and filed for divorce based on those allegations, but a quick review of the court records would have easily disproved her accusations. Despite this, some people assisted her in secretly leaving with our daughters. Adelia vowed to remain silent, but they admitted they had reached out to her last week to try and settle old grievances. In doing so, they also acknowledged that none of what she said about me was true. It became clear to me that Adelia was more focused on protecting the new life she had built for herself than on feeling any remorse or guilt over her actions. She appeared to carry on as if nothing had happened, until I stumbled across her photograph in the newspaper. Since my daughters hadn't reached out to me, it was obvious they had believed the lies she told them. At this point, all I can hope for, now that the truth has come to light, is to feel that some form of justice has been served. I realized that, like many other relatives, I had been cut out of my daughter's lives. Armed with a name, Helen managed to track down their current legal address, employment, and health status. She informed me that a meeting with a civil attorney was set for 2 p.m., emphasizing the importance of serving Adelia before taking legal action. I couldn't help but admire Helen's attention to detail. Reflecting on her request for a court order to freeze their assets, I knew that if she ever crossed paths with Adelia, there would be no forgiveness. At 4.30, when I returned to the office, I brought with me a chilled bottle of champagne and two delicate glasses with long stems. The case was now in the hands of a lawyer Helen had chosen, equipped with all the necessary documentation, including past court files, transcripts, a judge's decision, and sworn affidavits. I provided the lawyer with a copy of the arrest warrant for my wife, along with a newspaper article about her new life. I attempted to explain the dynamic between the three of us and how I first encountered him. The attorney was informed that Bank of America had complied with the requests, and we were considering suing them for knowingly aiding in the destruction of a life. I agreed, saying, if one lawsuit can cover the other, count me in. She smiled and replied, all right, let's get to work. I chuckled, acknowledging that we Americans have a reputation for suing over anything. Helen and I enjoyed the champagne I had brought, talking as we sipped. The phone rang, and Helen answered it, whispering softly, it's the judge. Put it on speaker, I suggested. Hello, Donald, how's it going today? I greeted him. Overall, not too bad, he said. I wanted to let you know that next Wednesday, the FBI will conduct a jury trial for Adelia Lynn Peterson and Ronald Emerson Peterson. They are also requesting a warrant for Miranda Peterson's detention and requiring all of them to undergo a DNA blood test. Judge Donald noted that my eldest daughter has now reached the age of majority and is no longer under their jurisdiction. I appreciate you informing me, I responded. Regarding my divorce, I'll offer her favorable terms as soon as I can, even if it has to be done via video link, I told Donald. I plan to hold her accountable for her actions against you, John. This is a serious issue, the judge remarked. After our conversation, Helen asked, the judge might be tough on her, but does he have the authority to imprison her? The FBI will likely handle the kidnapping charges and any related accusations, but the judge might consider a contempt charge for her failure to appear, I explained. I'm not sure what other legal actions he can take at this point, I suppose we'll have to wait and see, Helen said with a sigh. I've waited for over five years, so a few more weeks won't make a difference. Additionally, my lawyer will have some extra time to finalize the process and file the necessary paperwork, I said. No additional information was available. The following week passed swiftly. 
On Thursday morning, my lawyer informed me that the papers had been successfully filed. She mentioned that, as of Wednesday, she had managed to freeze all assets and bank accounts in her name. Later that day, FBI agent Doug Dale called, requesting that I visit St. Francis Hospital for a DNA blood test before 6 p.m. I agreed without hesitation. On Saturday morning, while fishing and having breakfast by the lake, my phone rang. It was Helen. I need you to go to the office and get today's USA Today newspaper, she instructed. There's an article saying that Adelia, Ronald, and Miranda were detained by the FBI at a social event last night, she said. I'm at the lake now, but I'll head to the office as soon as I return and change to see what's happening. My curiosity was piqued, and I needed to know what the FBI was accusing them of. It took me about an hour to reach the office, and Helen's tip was accurate. I was intrigued by the reporter's account. We all think we know what kidnapping is, but is our understanding accurate? Federal law defines kidnapping as using force, deceit, or intimidation to capture or detain people against their will, often for personal gain. It's a serious crime with an average prison sentence of 12 years. Adelia and Ronald Peterson are accused of kidnapping. She left Missouri with her children without her husband's permission, despite their ongoing divorce proceedings. Court documents reveal that she filed for divorce because she no longer loved him, but a warrant was issued for her arrest after she missed a court date, causing the divorce process to be halted. The article reports that our investigation into the couple, published three weeks ago, played a crucial role in Adelia's arrest. It reveals that Adelia used the surname Masters when she married Ronald Peterson in a civil ceremony in New York shortly after leaving Missouri. It has come to light that the adoption papers Ronald Peterson submitted for Amanda and Miranda Masters were based on forged documents, including a falsified signature of Mr. John Masters. The FBI now suspects that the couple orchestrated this scheme to conceal the Masters' daughters in a public setting. It was also uncovered that the couple had previously worked together at Bank of America in the early stages of their careers. Mr. John Masters attempted to compel the bank to disclose his ex-wife's whereabouts, but an appellate court issued an order preventing such disclosure. It appears that Ronald Peterson, as senior vice president of Bank of America, used his position to obstruct Mr. Masters from locating his legitimate wife and children. Furthermore, Mr. John Masters has initiated a civil suit against Adelia Peterson for defamation, accusing her of spreading false claims among over 20 acquaintances and family members. She allegedly accused him of ending his first marriage due to inappropriate conduct with her daughters. Although local law enforcement has found no evidence supporting these claims, Mr. Masters continues to face reputational damage five years later, leading to his social isolation. The article raises questions about whether John Masters' situation was truly as dire as it appears. It notes the two cases of attempted murder remain unresolved and suggests that he may have been involved in three deaths without facing justice. Additionally, he has sued Bank of America and Ronald Peterson for interfering in his marital affairs. Victims' perspectives should be taken into account, though this is often overlooked in our society, especially regarding criminals. Opinions are expressed, but they rarely make headlines unless they provoke significant public interest. Unfortunately, victims often endure prolonged suffering while criminals continue to benefit from societal privileges. The article was thorough and detailed. As I brewed a cup of coffee, my phone rang. I was surprised to find a reporter from the Southeast Missourian on the line, asking me to verify the information in the article. When asked about the past five years, I recounted the ongoing investigation into the attack on me, classified by police as attempted murder, and the defamatory rumors I had endured. I then turned the question back to him, seeking his thoughts on his experiences. He described it as hell, and I agreed with his assessment. Amidst the turmoil consuming my life, there is now a flicker of hope for restoring my reputation. Five years of damage have irreparably affected my relationships with my daughters, parents, and brothers. Once this chapter is closed, I plan to sell my business and leave the area permanently, provided the one person I trust agrees to join me. Before leaving the office, I carefully cut out the article and photos, scanned and printed them, and placed them in a legal envelope for my civil lawyer to use. Amanda Peterson was stunned when the FBI arrested her mother and stepfather, and her younger sister was taken away in a separate vehicle. She was relieved when the agent privately disclosed that her parents had never officially divorced, the name change had not been sanctioned by her real father, and all documents bearing his signature were fraudulent. 
Her mother faced accusations of taking her without permission, while her stepfather was charged with assisting her in concealing the truth. They faced multiple other allegations as well. Miranda would be kept under protection until her biological father was identified, since her mother still insisted that her stepfather was her real father. Amanda returned to their home to collect her belongings. While waiting for a connecting flight to Cape Girardeau at St. Louis Airport, she noticed a USA Today headline on an empty chair nearby. Intrigued, she picked up the newspaper and read the entire article. By the end, tears were streaming down her face. During the hour-long flight to the Cape, Amanda was overwhelmed with thoughts about her mother's choices, especially concerning her father. Nothing seemed to add up. Although her mother had shared details about Ronald and their relationship online, Amanda still had many unanswered questions, and her heart ached. She hadn't anticipated any changes in her life until her mother mentioned the possibility of divorcing her father. Sitting on the steps of the family home, she overheard a conversation between her parents over coffee after dinner. Her mother admitted she no longer loved her father and wanted a divorce, leaving him heartbroken. To her mother, he seemed like just another man who could be easily replaced. The recent revelations about her mother's past relationship with Ronald only added to Amanda's confusion. As the plane began its descent, Amanda was filled with questions. She wondered if there was a working phone in the abandoned car rental booth at the airport. It was 11 a.m., and she was parked at their old home, waiting for the sheriff's department vehicle to leave. After more than two hours of waiting, two unmarked cars suddenly blocked her path. An officer, armed with a pistol, approached and ordered her out of the car with her hands up. Without hesitation, Amanda complied. Who are you? Why are you here? The taller officer inquired. I'm Amanda Peterson. I was just waiting for the sheriff's department to leave so I could speak to my father, she explained. And your father's name? The officer asked. John Masters, Amanda responded. Oh no, the officer said, clearly surprised. Tom, go get Joe and Jod and make some coffee. It seems we've made an error. We need to have a serious discussion with Miss Peterson. He introduced himself as Detective Joel Smithers. I know your father well. What brings you back here after all this time? He asked. This is partly because of the article in USA Today from last night. I have a copy in my car. Would you like me to bring it? Amanda offered. Yes, please. It will help me understand your knowledge of the situation, Joel said. After introductions were made and coffee was served, Detective Joel Smithers read the article aloud. The rest of the team appeared shocked. Do you believe my father, Detective? Amanda asked. I'm among those who believe the rumors, unfortunately. By the time the rumors about your father spread among your mother's relatives, it was too late. He became the target of harassment, and his house was repeatedly vandalized, which eventually forced him to sell. The final straw was a brutal attack that nearly cost him his life. We were fortunate to find him before he bled out. The locals were ready to exact revenge based on what they thought he had done to your family, the detective said with regret. Your father has become quite a controversial figure, Detective Joel said. Jod purchased the house at a low price, but it wasn't until he started parking the sheriff's car in the driveway that things settled down. So, it was so overwhelming for my father that he had to leave. Where is he living now? Amanda asked. Many of us in the South have our own notions of justice. Your father now resides on five acres of land near Ryder Lake, the detective explained. The property is fully fenced with electric wiring and secured with an electronic lock. In the two years he's lived there, without a job, no one has seen him in the city, Detective Joel replied. How could I get in touch with him? Amanda asked. I think I have a way, Tom said. I'll ask the dispatcher to check if his company has a contact number. I'll be right back. A few minutes later, Tom returned with an address written on a piece of paper. I believe this is my mother's cousin's phone number, Amanda noted. According to our emergency records, she is the only one who can contact him directly. I spoke with her, and she agreed to speak with you, though she won't make any promises. From what I've gathered, Miss Beard is quite tough, firm, and reserved in personal interactions, Tom said. Helen is fiercely protective of your father, John. 
If she doesn't trust you, she'll do everything she can to keep you away from him. She's on her way to your father's workplace right now and has agreed to meet you there, Tom added, handing over the address. Amanda thanked him and laughed. What kind of person can harbor such intense hatred for someone? Jod, the new owner of the house, asked. Joanna, her daughter, was the reply. Someone who blames him for all the wrongs in her life. Helen activated the voice recording app on her phone as soon as the car stopped beside Amanda's. She quickly opened the door to let Amanda into the building. The first thing I need to know, Amanda, is what happened during your disappearance and what happened afterward, Helen asked. Amanda began, on Saturday morning, around 4 o'clock, my mother suddenly woke Miranda and me. We hadn't even had a chance to recover, but she told us to get dressed quickly and get into the car. Some of our clothes were already packed. She said we were leaving for a week-long, unexpected trip to New York. It was the first I'd heard of it, Amanda explained. It seems you were completely in the dark about this. Were you aware that Ronald and your mom were in contact online? Helen inquired. We thought it was just a friendship. I did see my mom talking to Ronald, but I had no idea they had worked together in the past, Amanda said. Mom mentioned meeting him at a regional conference and that they became friends. It wasn't until we were halfway to our destination that I realized our phones were missing. I decided to ask my mom about it, she continued. She told me the phones were turned off due to the move, and the remaining balance needed to be settled in full. The laptops, which were supposed to be packed and shipped with the furniture, never arrived. We spent two days traveling and were exhausted, Amanda said, clearly disappointed. When we got to the outskirts of New York, Mom instructed Miranda to pull out her new phone, which had a New York number. We were surprised, as we didn't know she had such a phone. Mom then had my sister open Google Maps, which led us to Ronald Peterson's house. It was only two hours later that we discovered his intentions. He had arranged a significant promotion for Mom so they could be together, Amanda continued. We were told to discard everything except family photos, which were sent to us later. While unpacking the car, my sister and I found completed adoption documents. Ronald claimed that our parents had agreed to the adoption because Mom was marrying him. Later, Mom told us that we should give Ronald a chance since he is our biological father, Amanda said, her voice heavy. Over time, we came to believe that once Dad learned about Ronald's true connection to us, he decided to cut us out of his life, Amanda said tears welling in her eyes. Amanda, I trust you because I've heard much of what you've shared with other family members. The school district has already provided your school admission documents so you can enroll as soon as you find a new place to live. Now that Adelia has been located, the truth is starting to emerge, Helen said reassuringly, taking Amanda's hand. I recorded our conversation and will send it to the FBI and your father. After that, we can go to Ruby Tuesdays for an early dinner, Helen said. While I do that, take a look at these notarized statements. Consider this, if your mother lied to you about your father John Masters, could she also be lying about Ronald Peterson? Helen left the room, keeping an eye on Amanda for a few moments before continuing her tasks. Amanda was stunned by the extent of her mother's family's conspiracy against her father. Helen promptly shared the incriminating conversation with me, my lawyer, and even the FBI. I wasn't surprised by my daughter's arrival and was relieved to meet her despite the gravity of the situation. Amanda stayed calm and composed, not addressing anyone directly. During this tumultuous time, I decided to send her a supportive message, I'll be waiting for you when you arrive. After giving her some time to review the statements she received, she responded that she had not attempted to contact anyone until everything was prepared, Helen said upon returning to Amanda. Helen, do you know why my mom told the family that my dad had been bullying us for years? Amanda asked. No one in the family approved of your father. Your mom was aware of this. I think she used it as an explanation for why she needed to disappear, taking you and your sister with her, Helen explained. Adelia knew your father would be searching for you, and he did. He even sued Bank of America to track down your mother's whereabouts. He won in court but lost on appeal. We only learned about your mother's marriage and the name changed recently, when your photo appeared in the newspaper. When your father went to court again, your mother sought help from the family in a desperate attempt to resolve her escalating problems, Helen continued. For over five years, your father has been a target due to your mother's actions. 
There were times we feared for his safety, Helen said, shaking her head. How is he holding up? Amanda asked, with genuine concern. He became more withdrawn, lost a lot of weight, and his hair turned almost completely gray from constant stress. The hate and threats on his Facebook page became so overwhelming that he was forced to deactivate his account. He even had to remove his name from the corporate Facebook page because he was being harassed there too, Helen replied. His business and life were attacked as a result of which he lost trust in people and became more withdrawn. Once sociable, now he trusts only a select few. Despite his freedom, he lives in fear of those who seek revenge. He goes to the city only for personal purchases, gradually rebuilding his life. Even his own family turned their backs on him, says Helen. Divorce is usually a difficult process, but what he went through was much more difficult. Many people in society still believe that he got away with killing the three of you, she added. Does dad have a girlfriend? Amanda asked. Given the reputation your mother has created for him, would anyone want to date him? Helen asked. For more than five years, he was forced to defend himself against false accusations that he could not refute. Every time he tried to defend himself, he was met with hostility, Helen added after a short pause. His situation has worsened because they have already decided everything. He found himself alone, and our sudden disappearance only aggravated his suffering and instantly gave credibility to my mother's accusations. Adelia and Ronald have organized everything perfectly, Amanda said through tears. The only one who really suffered the consequences is your father, Helen said glumly. When Amanda was about to cry, Helen suggested they go out to eat, which would somehow alleviate the situation. For the last five years, she has been constantly by her father's side, but at what cost? When they reached Helen's car, Amanda stopped. Thank you, Helen, she said. Helen asked in confusion, for what? Amanda's response took her by surprise. For having the courage to love and support my father all these years, she said. The emotion she had been holding back finally burst out, and as tears streamed down Helen's face, Amanda offered her comfort. This scene played out while I was sitting in my car outside the Ruby Tuesday restaurant, looking forward to their arrival. I could hardly find the words to address my child, whom I had not seen for more than five years. My emotions were in turmoil as I replayed Helen and Amanda's conversation in my head many times. Part of me believed what I heard, but the other part wasn't sure. As I watched them drive up to the restaurant, get out of the car, and walk to the front door, my hands were shaking so much that I gripped the steering wheel tightly. I was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Amanda had grown up to be an amazing woman, and I saw in her the traits of my own mother. I felt a wave of sadness wash over me, they disowned me soon after they disappeared from my life. I turned off the engine and got ready for one of the shortest and most painful walks of my life. The waitress who served me a few weeks ago was now playing the role of hostess. She immediately informed me that Amanda was present and I asked to speak with her. When we arrived, the waitress informed me that Amanda would be standing with her back to us. Have you come to make peace? She asked. I nodded, and she assured me that they were ready to talk. Helen noticed me immediately and greeted me with a smile. Amanda turned to face me and burst into tears. I went over to her and sat down next to her, taking her hand to calm her down. It had been more than five years since I'd looked into my daughter's bright blue eyes. We looked at each other in silence, with tears in our eyes. There are times when words cannot express the depth of emotions. Sensing this, I asked the waitress to bring us a generous flask of their homemade wine. The waitress silently poured us the first glass and then left us alone. Amanda was amazed at how much I had transformed. I must have lost at least 40 kilograms, which made my face look longer, thinner, and older. My silver white hair only complemented a new look that many women would envy. Amanda stood up resolutely, urging me to follow her example. We met at the edge of the table and hugged tightly. Daddy, she exclaimed, and I answered her with Alma, her old nickname. At that moment, we were able to melt the ice and calm our emotions. When we ordered the food, Amanda was surprised at how differently I ate. I've always been a fan of meat and potatoes, but now I've ordered a catfish dish with an unlimited number of salads. I found that I had filled my plate with salad three times when Helen went to fill hers. Amanda took the opportunity to talk to me alone. Helen loves you, Dad, she said. 
Hallen interrogated me like an experienced army sergeant, determined to make sure of my honesty before giving me another chance. I have to admit, I deserve it. Even though I'm old enough to make my own decisions, I couldn't do the right thing. I will never forgive myself for this, Amanda said bitterly. Over the past five years, I have not been able to offer anyone a life worth sharing. If at some point during this time a body had been found and one of you had been identified, I don't know how I would have coped, I replied with a lump in my throat. Most likely, I would have ended up in prison. Many in society suspect that I could have committed a crime and escaped punishment. Therefore, three years ago, I decided to change my will, leaving all my property to her after the second incident when I was hospitalized due to a knife attack. I thought my life was over, but it was Helen who supported me in a difficult moment, I said. When Helen returned and saw Amanda crying, she asked what was said to inflame the situation. It's nothing special. I told you how I was in the hospital, how you took care of me. I have revised my will, leaving everything to you. They believe that it was your love that saved me from the edge of the abyss, I replied to Helen with a gentle smile. Now there were two women with me, tears streaming down their faces. We had lunch together and then returned to the rented car. The ladies decided to come with me to my secluded home on Ryder Lake. They were impressed by a private house overlooking the lake, for bedrooms upstairs, and a spacious living room. The house has a spacious living room, an open-plan kitchen, and a laundry room on the ground floor, with the master bedroom also located on the ground level. A covered walkway connects the garage to the house, making it easier to access it. When Amanda refused my offer to help her with her luggage, I thought she wanted to leave us alone, I said. Why didn't you tell me about your feelings earlier? Helen asked. I was trapped in my past, I replied. I didn't know what would happen next. The uncertainty was more frightening than any outcome, I added. Now that I have freed myself from the restrictions they imposed on me, I can provide you with a promising future that was previously unavailable, I happily informed. Helen grabbed my hand, her expression filled with joy. It looks like I'm going to have to sell my house, since there's no way I can let you part with this property, Helen said, winking at me. Despite my age, I still felt guilty when my daughter caught me kissing another woman. I can confirm this, because that's exactly what happened. For the next hour, we sat together rebuilding our relationship and remembering all the moments I missed in my daughter's life. I found out that she was stuck in an unloved job in the business world while simultaneously earning a master's degree in business management online. She wasn't actively dating anyone. Why don't you join us? I suggested. We have the resources and we need a new way of looking at things. You can start with a junior position and move on, Helen said. Are you really considering this possibility after everything we've put you through? Amanda asked. Absolutely, I replied with a beaming smile. For starters, we can offer you an annual salary of $45,000, I told Amanda. Wow, looks like I'm going to have to look for a place to live, she replied. Don't worry, we have a lot of space here, I reassured her. But I will expect you to help me around the house, just like before. Tears welled up in Amanda's eyes as she answered, Dad, why? I reassured her by saying, You are and have always been a big part of my life. Then I'll book a plane ticket for tomorrow to pack my things, if I find a suitable option, she said. Depending on the length of the trip, I will have to arrive in my car sometime on Wednesday. Let's add both of your phone numbers to my contact list, Amanda suggested. After completing this task, Amanda received a text message from Miranda, which she showed me. The message read, My mobile phone has finally been returned to me. The FBI is detaining me until it receives a DNA report that confirms whether Ronald Peterson is my biological father or not. An expert on the letter showed how they exposed fraud in drafting the adoption agreement. Miranda said she couldn't make calls, but she could send and receive messages because she was in a secure facility. Amanda informed her that she was with Helen and me now. She's flying to New York tomorrow to pack her things as she's moving into my house and joining my firm. Below, Amanda indicated my contact phone number. Miranda replied, asking to take her laptop and things with her. Amanda asked if she could get a copy of today's USA Today newspaper, as there is an article about us that she would like to read. Helen noticed that I was heading towards the terrace and joined me. How are you holding up? she asked. I feel emotionally overwhelmed, I confessed, hugging her. 
Why don't I take Amanda with me and grab some clothes from my house? Helen suggested. It will give you some space to deal with your emotions, she added. I sent her the program for the electronic gate lock so she could access it. I gave her the keys to the house so she could make copies, suggesting that we might need four of these keys. They were gone for about two hours, and I spent most of that time in tears. It seemed like all the pain and resentment that I'd been holding back for so long had finally burst out. When they returned to the house, I noticed a change in my behavior, as if a dam had burst. I greeted them with a smile, and they smiled back at me. I was standing on the terrace and getting ready to roast thawed steaks. I had already made the salad and baked the potatoes. I watched their animated conversation while each of them brought armfuls of things. After four trips, they had brought a significant number of things, which were now lying scattered on the master bed. During a very late dinner, I found out that Amanda was leaving at 8 o'clock on Sunday morning, and Helen and I would help her move her things tomorrow. I was glad to see the girls enjoying their meal. As we sipped coffee after dinner, my cell phone suddenly rang. The only person who had this number besides those present was the FBI. I replied with a simple, Hello? Hello, Mr. Masters, this is Doug Dale. I wanted to inform you that the DNA test results have confirmed that you are Miranda's father. We received confirmation about two hours ago and have already informed her about it. She wants to return home, so we scheduled her landing at Cape Canaveral at 7.30 on Monday morning, the agent said. I'll be there to meet her, I replied enthusiastically. This is great news. Besides, Amanda was on her way to see you last night. Please tell her that her sister saw a copy of this article on the internet, Doug added. When we broke the news to Ronald Peterson, he was shocked. Adelia had misled him into believing that Miranda was his daughter. Despite this revelation, he still faces a considerable period of time, the agent happily added. As soon as the situation calmed down, I asked about the legal names of my daughters. Their legal surname is Masters, which is confirmed by the court decision that we received on Friday morning. A copy of this ruling will be sent to your office on Monday, which will allow you to change their IDs, Doug Dale replied. That was the end of the conversation. I couldn't hold back the tears that suddenly welled up in my eyes. I was completely shocked and speechless, which made Helen and Amanda worried. Fortunately, I managed to regain my composure quickly. Miranda is scheduled to arrive at the airport at 7.30 on Monday morning. DNA tests have confirmed that she is indeed my daughter, I said. When Ronald Peterson found out about this, he was shocked because Adelia convinced him that Miranda was his child. I told you the good news, Helen expressed confidently, indicating that she had known the truth all along. I couldn't help but wonder if my ex-wife, Adelia, had ever revealed the truth to anyone. Amanda, I have sad news for you. The federal court has ruled that your adoption is invalid so you will have to change your last name to Masters, I said with a laugh. My daughter was overjoyed and rushed into my arms with tears in her eyes. The name Peterson had never seemed appropriate to her. After saying goodbye to Amanda, who returned to New York to pack her things, we went to Jackson to meet Helen's two brothers and their wives. They kindly offered to help move the furniture that she wanted to take from the house. Since I had only two bedrooms furnished, there was enough room in the house for her things. We completed the task in just one day. The whole story was published in the Sunday edition of the Southeast Missouri newspaper. We gathered at Hickory House for dinner, where everyone noted the joy radiating from Helen. Her sister-in-law jokingly suggested that after six months of cooking for Helen, I would finally gain weight. The restaurant owner, our good friend, congratulated me and insisted on paying for our lunch. It seemed to me that Helen's sisters-in-law were jealous of her new home. Although Helen and I offered to invite them and their families to lunch, they all declined but offered to attend our first housewarming party when we throw it for our extended family. We arrived at the airport at 7.15 in the morning, as the connecting flight sometimes arrived earlier. As I watched Miranda walk down the ramp from the small plane, my heart began to race. She was wearing blue jeans and a t-shirt, not at all the pigtailed girl I remembered. She had turned into an amazing young woman, and it was hard for me to understand how much she had changed. When she noticed me, her face lit up with a radiant smile, and she ran towards me. The sliding doors swung open to greet her, and with a joyful cry of daddy, she jumped into my arms. At that moment, emotions overwhelmed us, and we hugged tightly, 
both stunned by the reunion. The cameras were filming us from all sides, but we didn't pay attention to it. I overheard Helen talking to a reporter from Studio 12 about me and my daughters, the youngest of whom half the city thought I had harmed. It turned out that they had actually been abducted more than five years ago. The FBI has now detained their mother and her lover for this crime. This reunion marked the first time the sisters had met in five years. When we turned to face the reporter, Miranda introduced herself as my daughter, saying, my last name is Masters. Miranda began to tell the story into the reporter's camera. Five years ago, with the assistance of my mother's family, my sister and I were kidnapped. There were false rumors that our father bullied us, which is completely untrue. Although some members of my mother's extended family may engage in such disgusting behavior, my father is not one of them. Any attempt to harm him in the future is also an attack on me and my sister. We are a united family, and we will stand together against any injustice. During my parents' divorce, my mother told us that our father was just getting what he deserved. But none of us deserve the trauma and pain that her actions caused us. He is not only my father but also the most truthful person I have ever met, Miranda added. I introduced Helen to Miranda. Helen hugged Miranda and shared, Yesterday, Amanda and I had a serious conversation about everything we learned. It seems that your mother deceived and misinformed Ronald, as well as your father, in her desire to attract attention to herself. She almost ruined five lives. I think it's in the past now, Amanda and I know that you and Dad are planning to get married, Miranda said with a smile, changing the subject. Helen and I agree that we want to put this situation in the past, I replied. Good, good, Helen said. Do you mind if we call you mom? Miranda asked, with tears in her eyes. Helen said, you couldn't have said it better, Miranda. I agree, as long as you promise to be one of my bridesmaids. Let's have breakfast and then go to Macy's to buy clothes, I suggested. Shall we go to Denny's? Miranda asked. If they're still open, of course. But the Huddle House is the nearest place to a breakfast, if you don't mind, I replied. I was amazed at how much my daughter could eat and jokingly thought about sending her to live somewhere else. It was still unreal to me that my daughters had returned to my life in a way I never thought possible. Our house had truly become a home, and I was grateful for a second chance to find a family. While shopping at Macy's, I intentionally got lost and left. I felt out of place listening to women discussing underwear choices and sharing their feminine secrets. By the time they noticed my absence, I was already on my way back. Helen asked where I'd gone, to which I casually replied that I'd gone to the bathroom. I sat and watched Miranda try on different outfits, for some reason asking for my opinion. Personally, I thought she looked amazing in everything she tried on. After spending $300 on clothes, we left the store with two bags. When we returned to the house, Helen excitedly took Miranda upstairs to show her the newly furnished four bedrooms. Helen was overjoyed, and Miranda was admiring the rooms, clearly pleased with the result. We chose a room with suitable furniture for her bedroom. We decided to sit on the terrace to enjoy the peaceful atmosphere before the heat of the day became too strong. The ladies were drinking iced tea, and I was enjoying a cold beer. Feeling a surge of courage, I got up and walked over to Helen, putting the ring box in my pocket. I haven't officially proposed to you yet, I began, opening the box and showing off a set of three rings. Will you marry me when my divorce is finalized? Without hesitation, she happily replied, yes. Miranda managed to capture everything and quickly sent a photo to Amanda, along with a text confirming that the ring fit. I managed to get the ring size from her brother, and about half an hour later, an unexpected call came on Helen's phone. Miranda and I exchanged worried glances when Helen suddenly burst into tears. Embarrassed, I took her mobile phone away from her, and as soon as the caller said, Congratulations, Dad, everything fell into place. My second daughter was on the line. Are you on your way? I asked with a smile. I left yesterday at 4 o'clock and have been driving almost continuously since then. There is much less traffic and police on the highway at night. My car handles well at a little over 100 miles per hour. Please tell your sister that I have her things, Amanda said. Miranda asked how long she had to go. I told her that it was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon where she was and that there wasn't much time left to go. Then Amanda asked me to accompany her. 
I promised to send her a text message with instructions. I was torn between a sense of pride and anxiety, it seemed like she had been driving all day without stopping. The girls were eagerly awaiting her arrival, rushing to the door even before she got out of the car. Amanda looked exhausted but otherwise unharmed. It was only when I saw my daughters standing together that emotions overwhelmed me at once. Amanda's first request was to look at Helen's wedding ring, but before she could admire it, the home phone rang, and I hurried to answer it. It was my assistant Chris. He gave me good news. We are seeing positive shifts in our customer base as some of those we lost due to rumors are returning, and we are also acquiring many new customers, some of whom are out of state. Such an influx of business may require us to hire additional staff, which we are currently working on, he said. My daughter Amanda will start working with us next week, and although she is still inexperienced, she is striving to get a master's degree in business management, I replied proudly. Chris offered to take her on his team, recognizing that the job would be difficult but would allow her to gain valuable experience. I agreed to hire Chris Tucker because he was a single-minded person. Having just graduated from high school, he was the best in his class and eager to prove himself. Like many of us, he faced difficulties and setbacks but quickly recovered and achieved success. Chris soon realized that the business theories he was studying were not always applicable in real-world situations. He was humble enough to admit it and set an example for his team, forcing them to learn from their own experiences. He had a unique approach, if he saw someone making a mistake, he would stop them to explain where they had gone wrong. In his eyes, the only wrong question was the one that wasn't asked. Helen and I will take a vacation until the end of the week. We still have a lot to settle, I announced, due to the upcoming engagement and the girls return home. It was necessary to resolve legal issues as well as enroll Miranda in school. The news of our engagement was greeted with surprise and excitement. I just remembered that we received a courier letter from the FBI. Can you come and pick it up at 5? I asked Chris. He replied, yes, thank you for reminding me. I forgot about it. In the evening, the four of us drove into town to celebrate our first official family dinner at Red Lobster, a place my daughters had chosen. I parked in front of our office and asked Amanda if she wanted to see where she was going to work. She readily agreed, and we all went inside. When we entered, the secretary got up from the table and led us into the largest conference room. Inside, we were greeted by a grandiose cake and a huge poster with congratulations. Amanda was introduced to her new boss, and everyone present welcomed my new extended family. My daughters have already started calling Helen mom. We arrived at the restaurant around 6.30 in the evening, just in time for the start of their annual all-you-can-eat shrimp campaign. My daughters lost count after eating 140 shrimp and were amazed to see that I was eating raw lemons like oranges. My daughters and I sat down at the table to read the court's decision together. The judge noted that the document in question was easy to find on the internet and did not require a lawyer to create it. Moreover, handwriting experts established that the signature of John Allen Masters, that is mine, was traced in order to reproduce it. As a result of tracing, significant gaps formed in the ink flow which disrupted the natural sequence of the signature. When comparing several signatures on the same document, it became obvious that the spaces did not match in each of them. Over time, a certain pattern of behavior can be noticed in the way a person signs their name. This was noticeable in the third paragraph where it was noted that I never used my full middle name when signing. Another clue was the fixed date of my signature which, as the witnesses confirmed, was put after their departure from Missouri. On the second page, there was a court decision according to which Amanda and Miranda Peterson are not their legal names. During the week, we dealt with legal issues, making sure that all legal documents accurately reflected their real identities. First of all, we went to the Social Security office, then to the state's attorney's office to update their birth certificates and return their former names, and finally to the Department of Motor Vehicles to get a new driver's license reflecting their real identities. Personally, I felt great satisfaction watching the positive changes that took place at every stage of this process. On Thursday, I completed the last task, I took away their new mobile phones. The next day, Amanda and Miranda accompanied Helen and me to the Ford Grove dealership in Jackson. Helen allowed us to exchange her car as well as mine. Each of the ladies left in a Ford Escape car leased through my company. When I got home, I handed Amanda a check for the trade-in amount, which was deducted from our significant down payment. 
Finally, my divorce lawyer contacted me. He informed me that my daughters and I had to appear in court for a hearing schedule for one o'clock on Monday afternoon. I invited my friend Helen to join us, and she readily agreed. Sitting in the courtroom, we watched Adelia Lynn Peterson on a large monitor in front of us. She looked unremarkable without her usual flashy outfit, the orange jumpsuit she was wearing didn't do her any good. The judge asked if her lawyer had any comments on the contempt charge. The lawyer stated that in his opinion, she did not know that she was supposed to appear in court that day. The judge asked if the lawyer had repeatedly reminded her of this during the settlement of the case, to which he confirmed. The judge questioned the lawyer's competence in believing in the client's truthfulness, to which he replied in the negative. The judge then asked the client to plead guilty, to which she replied, I don't mind, your honor. The judge sentenced her to five years followed by serving her sentence in a state prison. Your honor, her lawyer interjected, isn't this too cruel? Judge McDonald replied, in my opinion, no, but she has the right to appeal. As for the divorce, it was decided in favor of Mr. Masters. She has lost all rights to the property left over from their marriage since the day she left the state with her daughters. He told my lawyer, draw up a divorce decree and include a waiver of the required waiting period. I think your client has been waiting long enough, your honor. My client has one last request and hopes that you will consider granting it, my lawyer began. Donald raised an eyebrow curiously. He recently got engaged to Miss Helen Beard and would like to know if you can hold their civil ceremony when they get married, my lawyer's words made Helen and the girls visibly nervous. I couldn't help but smile because the lawyer and I had foreseen this outcome. The judge congratulated them both, saying with a smile, that had been brewing for a long time. He said he would be happy to hold the ceremony. Helen and I clasped hands happily. Adelia's shocked face was still visible on the monitor. Her disbelief was obvious as she probably expected the maximum 30-day sentence for contempt of court, not this outcome. It must have been incredibly painful for her to find out in court that I was marrying her younger cousin. The judge banged his gavel and declared the hearing closed. When we got up to leave, the judge came up to me and shook my hand. I introduced him to my future wife and daughters with the respect I thought he deserved. He informed them that everything was fine and he was not in the dock at the moment. Before we left, he mentioned that we needed to go fishing together as soon as possible before it got too hot. I've never seen three girls so excited in my life. They were all chatting animatedly, filling the courtroom with conversations after such a long silence. I wished I had taken earplugs. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed one couple quietly leave the hall. I was surprised when I realized that it was my mom and dad. I expected to see them last, memories surfaced of how my father disowned me and broke off our relationship, saying that I was no longer his son. I quickly realized how accurate this statement was. Nothing pleases girls more than asking for help in organizing a wedding, this excitement filled our house when we returned to normal life. Helen decided to put her house up for sale, and Amanda easily joined my staff, her sharp mind did not go unnoticed by others. Miranda, on the other hand, spent the first week talking to old friends and rebuilding lost connections. Masters Consulting was overworked as it acquired two new corporations that needed complete restructuring to survive, as well as a significant cash inflow. Amanda shocked all of us by identifying missed issues that cost our customers millions in potential sales. It took her three weeks to fix this flaw, and the subsequent increase in sales was a pleasant surprise for everyone. In the evening, after a hard day, Helen and I lay in bed and talked. We both got used to our new parenting responsibilities, being in the same boat, she was adjusting to the role of mother, and I was getting used to the role of father again. Her question about starting my own family took me by surprise because I had never thought about it before. But knowing all that she had gone through with me, I couldn't refuse her. I replied with a smile, let's wait until our wedding photo shoot, dear, the timing depends on you. Helen's eyes sparkled with excitement as we began to plan our future together. It's clear that neither of us got enough sleep that night, and it's no wonder why. In the end, we exchanged vows on Mother's Day. Amanda was a bridesmaid, Miranda and another niece were bridesmaids, and Chris was my best man. My two nephews were the masters of ceremonies at a small event held in the backyard of our house against the background of a serene lake. Helen's brothers took over the preparation of the courtyard for the ceremony, and the judge conducted the wedding ceremony in a beautiful gazebo strewn with spring flowers. When we arrived at the event, the men were wearing blue jeans, 
cowboy hats, and matching boots, and the ladies were wearing fancy dresses. Helen looked stunning in a classic white wedding dress, and her bridesmaids wore stunning yellow dresses. The big family did their best by cooking a delicious barbecue. Later in the evening, our patio turned into a lively dance floor with live music. Meanwhile, life went on in full swing. When the criminal trial of Adelia and Ronald began, Ronald filed for divorce while my civil lawyer was negotiating with the opposing attorney and the Bank of America legal team on this case. I was looking forward to our first Father's Day in our new family. I knew that my wife and daughters were planning something special, but the details remain a mystery to me. On Father's Day, Helen and I woke up early to spend the morning at the lake and fishing in our canoe. The fish packed willingly, and it didn't take us long to catch our share. As soon as the flies sank into the water, when we were about to return to the shore, Helen discreetly handed me a postcard that she kept with her. I eagerly unfolded it and saw the inscription, Happy Father's Day, Daddy. We're pregnant, and it's a boy. Overcome with joy, I jumped up in excitement, causing the canoe to capsize. We lost all our belongings, fish, fishing rods, and a box of gear soaked through. We swam back to shore, where the girls, who already knew about Helen's news, found my revelation amusing. It took some time for the chaos to subside, and we were able to comprehend the unexpected turn of events. My whole worldview changed when I witnessed the birth of my son. He was born with a loud scream and weighed seven pounds. I surprised my mother when I urgently called her and asked her to come to the maternity ward of the hospital. When she arrived, I hurried her to Helen's room where she was holding our son in her arms. His name is Colin Richard, I announced. My mother was beside herself with excitement, that was her grandfather's name. As for my father and me, we still don't communicate. I gave him a chance, but he hasn't taken it yet. He is not taking any action at the moment, but every new morning brings a new beginning, and life goes on.